evening with Ben Muldrow. Hi, Ben. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you. Terrific. We'll get to Ben's webinar in a few minutes, but first, uh, just a little little bit of Ian McKeaton here to briefly update this community on the design workshop RFP that just closed on Tuesday. So she'll just take a minute to update because people on this, because a lot of people might have um, taken notice of that RFP. Cynthia, go ahead. Hi, Sam. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, I want to thank the 48 communities that submitted their applications to us by our May 6th deadline. Um, we are now in the process of reviewing them and distributing them to our selection panelists for their review and scoring. Uh, we will convene the selection panelists um, in mid-June, give them about three weeks to review and score the applications. And then we will be back to the finalists for further follow-up interviews um, towards the middle end of June. And hopefully we'll be notifying the successful applicants uh, on or about around the 4th of July. Something to celebrate. Uh, so thank you all so much. We had 26 states represented um, and places that had not submitted CERT applications in the past. So once again, wanted to thank you uh, to those of you who applied. For those of you who are not familiar with our program or our website, and anyone on the line, we um, suggest that you go to www.rural-design.org. There are many resources. The um, blog posts and podcasts of these webinars are posted there. And we are doing what we can to bring as many resources as we can to rural communities all over the U.S. facing a design challenge. So I will turn it back to you, Fran. Okay. Thank you so much, Cynthia. So today's webinar will focus on creating strong place brand that supports community and economic development outcomes. And I'd like to note that we had to cap registration today. We hit capacity at 275 registrants, those sm folks smart enough to sign up early. Uh, however, everyone who registered will be able to play back the webinar at a later date. Um, and I'm just thrilled also that, that these are so popular and that we're not only uh, getting plenty of people from the United States and Canada, North America, but also from Brazil, um, Australia, New Zealand. We had someone from uh, South Africa a little while ago. This is very exciting, and clearly you are all folks that care enough to make your communities more vibrant. We welcome all for this one-hour program. The Adobe platform for the webinar allows us to interact just a little bit differently. All the interaction will be done online. Many of you have already sent in questions, and we want to thank you for that. Ben has reviewed those and believes he will cover most of your question during his webinar. Still, we'll leave about 15 minutes at the end for questions that may not have gotten uh, answered or new ones you know, that come up during the program. A Q&A box is, will pop up for you to write your questions that come up during the talk. Also during the presentation, Ben may ask you to participate via the platform in a chat box or a poll. That interactivity will be obvious on your screen if he calls for it. If you have any technical problems, you can dial star zero for phone issues or email us at info at communitymatters.org. So let's go on to the webinar. Our speaker, Ben Muldrow, is a partner at Arnett Muldrow and Associates. He's responsible for all community marketing and branding functions of the Greenville, South Carolina-based urban planning firm. He has branded more communities than anyone else in the world. Now, that's quite something. At about 35 communities a year, Ben helps towns and neighborhoods develop their brand identity through an open process, including public design sessions and collaborative small groups. He has designed new branding and marketing elements for revitalization projects in over 300 communities, has been a strategic branding, communications, advertising, and graphic design business. Um, he's been doing all of that stuff throughout his career. Welcome, Ben, and let's uh, go on with your webinar. It's great to have you here. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. I I'm going to do my best to to give you all an opportunity to uh, get used to my voice. I might have a little bit of an accent for some of you all. Um, hailing from South Carolina, I'll do my best to, uh, to speak in a way that you all can understand. Um, 
I'm really pleased to be here. And as Fran said, um, I've had the privilege of working with, at this point in time, over 350 communities in 30 states across the, the United States. And one of the interesting things is the way that we got into this process of developing community brands was through identifying inefficiencies in the implementation of planning processes uh, in small and rural communities across the country. So what we actually started to do was integrate these branding processes into revitalization and downtown master planning efforts. And uh, through that, over the past uh, 14 years, I've been able to work in, in communities in, in a wide variety of sizes, all the way from about 130 in rural Mississippi, uh, all the way up to, to neighborhoods and districts in Los Angeles and Portland and Chicago. So the process itself is very scalable, and um, and I think the thing that we find over and over again is when you're talking about community branding, you're really talking about people. It is about getting the residents involved and and finding something that people can truly be passionate about. Now. Why do we brand? I think that's a, a very fair question these days. And one of the best ways to illustrate that is, is we talk about how we might have celebrated a, a child's birthday. In the 1920s, we'd go to the local general store. We'd buy flour, eggs, and sugar from that, that family store, and we'd spend about 50 cents. Now, in the 40s, we might go to that same locally owned store, but we'd buy a, a box of cake mix. We'd spend about $2. By the 80s, we'd go to the big chain supermarkets and strip malls, and we'd buy that quarter sheet cake for $12. And nowadays, we're spending 1200 bucks on inflatable castles for our kids. Now, what that does is that really helps us to illustrate this transition from a raw material economy into a product, then service, and now an experience economy. And this experience economy allows the consumers to truly focus on how things make them feel. So what I always like to tell people is branding is the preservation of the essence of your place. It is not theming. It is not trying to take a place and make it something that it's not. It is identifying that, that motivating Factor. It's about identifying the personality traits that connect the residents that call a place home. And in identifying those and being able to use those to help tell your story, you best position your community to preserve its quality of life while growing its own economy. Now, we talk a good bit about branding, but I think there's some fair nuances we need to point out about community branding. One of the things that we all have probably seen is the ever-present city feel. Now, communities all over the country and world have used these seals to denote um, what they do and who they are. But the thing that I'm here to tell you today is this is not a marketing tool. This is an appropriate graphic identity to have in your system. But it is not the way to market your place or to truly tell your story. In fact, many times we reference systems that colleges and universities use, where a college and university might have an athletic logo and an academic logo. And those two are very different. Um, heaven forbid the football team has a bad season. They don't want it to affect admissions and vice versa. Um, the actions of your elected officials and the staff of your government might not always be the things that we want most strongly connected to a positive destination-based brand identity that we are trying to create and, and invest brand equity in for our place. So being able to create a little bit of separation between those two is extremely important. Now, I have the distinct pleasure today of sharing with you the worst logo ever. And it hails from my, my home state of South Carolina, and it is for the great community of St. Stephen, South Carolina. Now, this seal is 
a visual representation of what you get when you employ design by committee. It has so many things going on with it. You know, obviously, they've got industry there denoted by nothing less than pine trees. Um, no logo is good if it does not incorporate a tractor. We've got recreation. Man, doesn't that look fun? Um, you know, one of the things that, that was asked, one of the questions that came in before was, is it possible to create an impactful brand for a community when you feel so compelled to be diplomatic in the way you represent yourself and try to make sure that you cover all your bases. I think the St. Stephen logo is a perfect example. When you attempt to say everything, you end up saying very, very little. I think my favorite part about this one is St. Stephen was so proud to be Americans that they included the head and legs of an American eagle, but they simply could not find room to get the wings in there. Now, along this same path, um, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about taglines. And this next tagline that I'm going to share with you is not necessarily the worst, but it is the first place that people get to. Any variation of preserving the past, embracing the future. Now, this is a concept that I hear over and over again whenever I engage the public. It is that first level of creativity that members of a community come to when they begin to be introspective and look upon themselves. Every community knows that they want to know their story, pay honor to their past, but they don't want to be hindered by that past. They don't want to be held back, and they want to be focused on a vision for a bright future. That is a perfectly, perfectly fine concept. But the thing that I will tell you is by making this message – you are saying the same thing that every other community says. And we want to take that as a first step down the road of creativity and keep exploring that path, finding things that really tie in to the true essence of your community. My guess would be with all the attendees that we have on the line right now, there probably are some of you out there whose own community is using some sort of variation of this phrase right now today. Now, from there, we talk a little bit about bad graphic images, bad messaging, and then we hit into some of the worst implementation. And this is one of my favorites. This is from the town of Severance, Colorado. And as you can see, it says, where the geese fly and the bulls cry. Now, they have an elevation of 4,894 feet and a population of about 409, so not a huge community. When I first saw this sign, I'll have to admit, I thought that the tagline, the geese fly and the bulls cry, it must relate to a beef slaughter industry. In this particular part of Colorado, there were heavy ranches. Uh, there were a lot of cattle in the area. I just assumed that the major economy of Severance was um, was a place. It, it was it was tied into that that cattle industry. Well, sadly, the thing that I found out is even worse. Um, the reference is to a local business called Bruce's Bar, who is known for its delicacy of serving Rocky Mountain oysters. So literally. Their community has tied their entire identity around a delicacy made from bull testicles. Now, I always use that as a perfect example to say to folks, there is a huge difference between saying something that no one else can say and saying something that no one else wants to say. Being able to create a, a, a system that allows you to grow on your own uniqueness, but it doesn't mean that you have to go out and find a statement that no one else can make. When Nike first used the, the phrase, just do it, 
any shoe company could have employed that. But Nike said it. They repeated it over and over again, and they made it mean something. So much so that at this point in the game, nobody else would get anywhere close to that statement. Now, I want to run through a couple others pretty quickly. This is Linesville, Pennsylvania, where the ducks walk on the fish. Um, this is a, a community that has a fish elevator, and apparently all the townspeople will go down to the fish elevator and feed bread to these fish. The ducks decided that they wanted a piece of the action, so they would walk out there and get the bread before the fish could get to it. Again, like I say, big difference between what no one else can say and what no one else wants to say. We have La Crosse, Kansas, the barbed wire capital of the world. Gas, Kansas, um, don't pass gas, stop and enjoy it. And, of course, the city of Hooker, Oklahoma, it's not a location, it's a vocation. Um, being clever and being funny is a very valid tool, but when you are going and thinking about the, the personality of the overall community, I think you have to pay a lot of attention to how you craft that message. I want to reiterate, a brand is not a theme. A lot of the questions that we got were focused in on these, these ideas of do we need to change the personality of our community. We're not changing the personality at all. We are going and trying to identify and create a way we can tell that story. So. One of the things that we really focus in on when we're developing a brand to help tell that story, whether it's a city, a downtown district, a county, or a larger, larger multi-county region, one of the things that's unique about branding a community is the, the ability and flexibility that that system needs. In a corporate brand, you have a very strong corporate image, and everything is passed from the top down. When developing a community brand, we often say it needs to have the ability sometimes to serve as an umbrella, covering up everything, gathering it together, and creating a nice protected image, while other times that brand needs to serve as a plate, offering up the amenities of the community as entrees on that plate. It has to have the ability to be both strong and subservient. And that is the key factor to tying in to implementation, buy-in from your communities, multi-organizational buy-in. It's that ability to go through and create a system that allows organizations to be a part of it without feeling like they have given up their own individual identities. And we'll show you some examples of that. Now, as we go through this process, we focus on creating four main elements of the brand toolbox. The first, we define uniform typefaces that can be used to connect. Um, next, we move on to color palette. We actually define uniform colors that can be used over and over again throughout communications. Then we define an, a graphic approach. And then finally, we craft a message. And we craft that message with something that we call a brand statement. This brand statement is a, it really is kind of an act of diplomacy. As we go through the process, we have stakeholder meetings. We meet with uh, locals throughout the entire process, and we constantly hear things that they are identifying that are important to them. We then weave those into this brand statement and allow us to show everyone that participated in the process that they were heard, and then show them how what they said was important converted into a simple direction for the overall branding system. Now, a byproduct of this, I often tell people that uh, when they ask me what I do, I tell them I'm a community therapist, because one of the biggest things that we have to focus on in developing brand systems and positioning communities to maximize implementation is simply teaching the organizations in a community how to work together. Believe it or not, 
a chamber in a Main Street organization or an arts council and an economic development agency are not enemies. They are individual organizations with individual goals and individual target markets. So being able to create an energy between those organizations and a clear realization that those groups are out there cultivating a specific message for a specific target market. Those are things that we really want to see come out of this process. Now, the first example that we're going to go to is a community called Opelousas, Louisiana. Opelousas is about 20 minutes or so east of uh, Lafayette, and uh, it's a very, very interesting community. First of all, they're the birthplace of Zydeco music. So if you know anything about Zydeco, it was uh, started there. They also were the home of a man named Clifton Chinois, who uh, created the, the instrument that you see down there on the bottom left, the, the rub board. Um, he actually took that and, and uh, where they used to use washboards, created the actual instrument called the rub board. Um, they're the home of Tony Satcheries, which is the world's leading producer of Cajun and Creole seasonings. Also, Savoy's, which makes more jarred roux, which is an in integral uh, ingredient in, in Cajun and Creole cooking. Um, they have this, this huge connection with both food, flavor, and music of this overall region. And they also are the third oldest community in Louisiana. Now, we heard that in stakeholder group after stakeholder group. People kept talking about we're the third oldest, we're the third oldest. You know, when you look at that all by itself, that's not necessarily the most compelling message. Um, there aren't a lot of people that are putting together tours of the state's third oldest communities. But one of the things that, that it, it is, it is very much tied in to the history and culture of Louisiana, which is known for having a very rich and dark history. Now, we also have to look at the communities that surround Opelousas and focus on how they are telling their story and promoting themselves. Now, as you can see with the Lafayette and the Iberia, um, there's a lot of dancing letters going on there. There's a lot of chili peppers. Um, a lot of this stuff has a very busy look to it. Busy doesn't always mean bad, but it, there's just a lot going on. Um, and we wanted to create something that could stick out in comparison to their competitors. So we started out with the word. Now, granted, no community has ever allowed us to change their name. So we always have to deal with what we're, we're dealt. Um, Opelousas is obviously is a strange name. It's an unusual name. It's foreign to most of us. So we wanted to create something that made it a little bit easier for us to read. Typically, one of the things that does not get paid attention is how the name of the community actually appears. We put so much focus on the graphics that we don't really think a whole lot about the word type. So that is where we always start. Here are four different styles. The top is called title style. Then we have down style. Then we have small caps and all caps. And the thing that we really want to, to think about here is not just as letters, but as graphic elements. So there is no right or wrong answer, but each one brings a different feel to the identity. So here, one of the things I always tell folks, that second one, the down style, where the, the uh, community's name is not capitalized. You know, if you have a lot of retired English teachers, you're going to have some trouble with that one. Folks like to argue, hey, we're a proper noun, doggone it, we need that. Um, where you might have a community or a district that is, is more progressive, more young, you know, got this energy to it, they might lean more towards that. Because of the nature of the name, we decided to pick that top one, the title style. And then from there, we started to look through different typefaces. Finally, we landed on a, an ornate script typeface. We wanted something that really illustrated this, this class, this age, and this beauty of this community. We needed to give them a little shot in the arm to remind them how beautiful their community was. So finally, we landed on this. 
Um, and here you see the tagline that we introduced, where we combine the third oldest, we combine all of this connection with Zydeco music and the music of, of the region, combined with this heavy, heavy, not just connection, but economy based off of food. So we introduced this tagline of perfectly seasoned. Now, from there, we began to create icons and a series of graphics that allowed us to tell this story. So we have the overall system with perfectly seasoned. And then what we've been able to do is create three different tracks where we talk about these cultures and these offerings that we have, seasoned sounds, seasoned, seasoned flavors, and seasoned culture. And in those, we're able to highlight whether it's the accordion and the uh, fiddle, whether it's the, the seasoning shaker, or whether it's the floor to lay tying into that, that statewide culture. So then all of a sudden, you have this system that begins to come together. Now, one of the interesting things about Opelousas was, you know, we ask during these stakeholder groups, we ask, you know, what color are you? And typically, community members will say, oh, you know, we're – we're greens because we have lots of trees, and we're blues because we have the sky and water. Well, in, in Opelousas, it was interesting. They they would sit there and immediately jump in, and we had a lady say, well, you know, we're not quite paprika. And, you know, everybody kind of laughed. And, and really what it came down to was what they were saying, they connected with this very unique color of the Tony Thatchery seasoning. And I'll tell you how we were able to take that and run with it here in a second. But, you know, one of the things that, that we always start with is we have to start with any branding system with reminding the residents why that place is great. If you go through and you create a brand and your goal is to go out and market to external markets and you pay no attention to the people that live right there at home, then you are not going to be able to deliver on the messages that you convey to those external markets. It is absolutely essential that you remind the local why it is that the place they call home is so important. We did that here in Opelousas with this campaign called It's Great to Be Us. Now, from there, I talked a little bit about that color. That color kept coming up over and over again. So what I did that night was I went to the local grocery store. I bought a thing of Tony's seasoning. I went to the uh, hotel, poured it out on the little tray there in the hotel, and took a picture of it. And this is that picture. That picture then became the background for their shopping and dining guides, the background texture for their billboards, and the backgrounds for all of their ads. So this really allows us to get in and start to – integrate in those things that people said were important into the overall composition. Now, you know, when we talk about history, communities love to talk about how rich their history is. Um, strangely enough, I've never been to a community that didn't have a history, but I've been to some that didn't have real interesting his histories. The great thing about Opelousas is it's one thing to sit there and say Zydeco music was born here. It's a whole other thing to say you can hear it here five nights a week. And that is the situation that they had. It was a historical reference that could still be experienced. And that always provides you far greater opportunity to use that to your advantage. So here we have an ad kind of showing off some of that Zyka music. Uh, this was a local participant. Um, his name actually is Joe Citizen. We do these stakeholder meetings a lot, and we talk about the generic Joe Citizen. He came up after the meeting and introduced himself to me. He was like, hey, I just want to introduce myself. I'm, I'm Joe Citizen. I was like, oh, my gosh, it's great to meet you. I, I talk about you all the time. But he was the connection between the Zydeco music and the community events. He was the one that really came out and made it happen. They're the home of four different Grammy winners right there in Opelousas. They're also the home of a, an NFL player named Devery Henderson. And about two weeks after we were there doing this process, the Saints went on to win the Super Bowl. To our knowledge, Devery Henderson is the only person that we know of who played high school, college, and pro ball in only one state and went on to win champions and, and championships in all. So that's a great story that we were able to share, and they were, they were big, big fans of Devery. Now, 
With that, we're going to jump over across the country to Hollister, California. Many of you might have heard of Hollister. Um, the, you probably have actually heard of Hollister, California, and you might have seen it in your local shopping mall. Well, the thing that's kind of interesting about that is if you know anything about that Hollister, California brand in your local shopping mall, it is surf shops and, and uh, shirtless black and white photos of men. Um, Hollister, California is nothing like that. Hollister, California is an agrarian community uh, about an hour south of San Francisco. Their local high school mascot is the hay baler. They're the only community that we ever knew that has been sued by a corporation for making T-shirts with their own name on it. So obviously we were walking into a situation that, that had some built-up tension already. Uh, we started out by defining the color palette there, and the color palette that we created was completely inspired by the things that they grew. So there was a direct connection. Now, all of a sudden, when somebody says, ah, oh, you know, I don't really like that green you picked, it's like, well, I'm sorry that you don't like it, but here's the strategy behind the selection. And now, all of a sudden, something that might have been a purely subjective opinion is now being met with a strategic recommendation. So we started out with the overall logo. Um, just to get a little jab in there, we introduced this tagline and this concept of Hollister, the original. We carried that jab on into the original downtown Hollister, the opposite of a mall. Everything that you um, don't expect, like customer service and unique businesses and a great overall time uh, can be found there in downtown Hollister. The other thing that we did was we created an excursion campaign for them to target to that San Francisco market. I told you before that their mascot was the hay baler, so we positioned them as the perfect place to bail. From that, we showed them different images, whether you're uh, the viticulture, whether it's outdoor sports, off-roading. They offer all of those. But then the thing that really took hold was this idea of the original Hollister model. Like I said, if you know anything about Hollister and Abercrombie and & Fitch, they're known for the black and white photos um, that feature folks in the, the – um, in their clothes. Well, here what we wanted to do was we wanted to take that and replicate it, featuring the people in the community, um, whether it was ranchers, whether it was farmers, and even the bikers. They have very heavy biker presence in the community. So being able to take something that people knew and help to tell this unique story of this place that people thought they knew, Hollister, California, but in actuality, here's the rest of the story. Now, we round the corner to one of my favorites. This is right up the road from where I grew up, a small community called Traveler's Rest, South Carolina. Now, if you know anything about our neck of the woods, sadly, as nice as this name is, um, nobody in our area calls Traveler's Rest, Traveler's Rest. They call it TR. And in fact, Sadly, because of how we talk in South Carolina, they don't call it TR, they call it TR. I'm going to go up to TR. And as we were working with Traveler's Rest, we, we told them, it's like, you know what, realistically, you don't have the resources to make people quit calling you TR. But what we can do is we can make TR mean something good. And the thing that we knew about Traveler's Rest at the time was they really didn't offer much in the way of destination. One of the things that we hear a lot from communities is they love to position themselves as gateways. We're the gateway to the Appalachians. We're the gateway to the Great White North. Well, gateways typically imply that there's no real thing to do there. So instead, we're simply a place that you pass through to go to other places. So we typically stray away from gateway monikers, but Traveler's Rest, because of the little that they had to offer at the time and the access to multiple state parks and the Blue Ridge Mountains, they serve as a geographic portal into that. We wanted to employ a base camp strategy for them. We wanted to take this idea of 
traveler's rest, TR, turning it into a good thing, and a base camp strategy, and we introduced this concept of get in your element. So what we did was we designed a logo that was based off of an element off the periodic table. And then we simply launched this system with it starts with TR. Tradition. Tranquil. Travel. Trails. Trip. Trek. Trees. Transported. Now, one of the things that was really exciting about this system was as we presented it, first of all, we were taking regional assets and we were converting those regional assets into assets that the community could truly be proud of. But what was really magic was as we went through this, we had members of the community, members in the audience. In fact, we had one who was worked at the local Ford dealership, and he stood up and he said, trucks start with PR. And then all of a sudden, the business community all started to talk about what could their TR word be? So now, out of a very, very simple concept, these have been able to be taken on by not just the public sector, but the private sector as well. The simplicity and the ease of buy-in created a system that allowed the business community to work in tandem and start to truly build a sense of place for Traveler's Rest. Now, one of the exciting things, there's, a, there's been a lot that's happened since we did this. We did this uh, campaign, wow, it's been almost 10 years ago. And Traveler's Rest has had some amazing things happen in that meantime. They created a Rails to Trail that connected to the uh, local community, Greenville, South Carolina, next door that is about a 30-mile trail that connects directly into Greenville's downtown. That connected node created enough of a stream of business to foster a full revitalization of this community. The community is invested in streetscape. Their local tax base has increased exponentially. They have cool businesses that are experience-oriented that have now opened all over the community. Um, in fact, two weeks ago, they had this trail that they just opened, um, or that's been open a couple of years. It's called the Swamp Rabbit. They have just recently opened the Swamp Rabbit uh, Brewery right downtown. Um, Williams Hardware, all kinds of businesses that have opened up and are really fostering a true sense of place. So now they were able to convert that base camp mentality into creating a true sense of des uh, destination. And in addition to that, we're lucky to, to have a, a local resident, a guy by the name of George Hintappy, who was a professional cyclist that raced with Lance Armstrong and owns a, a business making cycling products called Hintappy Sports. He's recently purchased and created a new cycling-oriented destination hotel called Hotel Domestique. And they are charging $279 a night for cyclists from all over the country to come, stay, and be able to go on rides with George Hincapie. And they proudly announce, not that they're in Greenville, South Carolina, but they announce that they are in Traveler's Rest. So they were able to create a system that truly allowed them to grow their community and grow their economy. Now, this process that we take is a very, very interesting one. Um, everything that you see was done in three days. Our goal on any process that we do is to have, at the very least, 100 voices, three days and 100 voices. Our first day, we go in, and it is purely focused on input. We have stakeholder meetings. We have public meetings. We invite people out to, to share their ideas with us and to help us as we really kind of craft the essence of that community. The second day is spent on the ground doing photography and talking to people one-on-one -on -one in the businesses. 
And um, it, it's one of those places that it is really it's, – it's a kind of magic part to be able to really connect with the community. The third day is then focused on production, where we create all our recommendations on site, and we conclude the third day with a presentation back to the community as a whole. So everything that you've seen, the Opelousas, the Hollister, the Traveler's Rest, all were created on site in three days, and all that product was created in that time. We focus on a process that is based on public participation. We have public participation in the right time of the process, and that is the front end of the process. You have to combine the expertise that people have with the place with the expertise of branding and sharing a message. And in doing that, in creating this, this tight process, in being able to hear from folks and then turn around and deliver a response to them mere days later, helps to maximize that buy-in. They feel a part of the product. In fact, I'm pleased to say we worked in a community last week we were there Monday through Wednesday. We presented to the community on Wednesday evening. And this Monday, the city council was presented the recommendations and voted unanimously to approve the system. Now, the thing is that, sadly, this happens a lot where you'll hire somebody, they'll come in and they'll say, well, the process is going to take us three months. It's going to take us four or six months. Well, the sad thing is they probably put about as much time into it. But the first thing that they have to do is learn how to brand a community because branding a community is different from branding shoes or laundry detergent. And then they have to go through and they have to figure out how to create concepts and walk through the process. We feel like being able to immerse yourself in the community and being able to merge the local expertise of the place with an outside point of view is hugely important. And I think one of the things that I always try to focus in on is, is remembering that when you have these great rural communities all over the country, it's kind of like having a classic car, a true American classic. I actually, I have a 67 Mustang, and that 67 Mustang takes constant work and constant, constant maintenance and constant money. Now, why in the world would anyone be motivated to invest that kind of time and money into something that you could easily turn around and go and get a Honda Accord. Well, it's because we're passionate about it, and we want to use that passion to be able to drive the ongoing care that these true American classics need. And being able to go through and kind of focus in on that, that is why people that own classic cars take those cars to cruise zones. They need other people to tell them how beautiful that car is. We're the exact same way in communities, fighters' point of view. We need to be reminded of why the things that we see every single day are great, why they're worth investment, why they're worth taking care of, of and, and really maintaining and enhancing. We are the stewards of a very special place that we call home. And, it's, and with that, it's right about 4.45. I, I did my best I, to, to kind of pound through this. Fran, I'd love to, to move into right. a 15 minutes of question and answer if we could. Wow, that was exactly on time, Ben, and a remarkable presentation. Thank you so much. And I'd just like to uh, mention to everybody, um, if you do have a question, you need to do it online. Uh, we have everybody on mute because uh, we have um, nearly 200 participants today but you are welcome to enter your question in the Q&A section. And I, and I think, Ben, you really answered a lot of people from Colorado, Minnesota, Indiana, um, New Jersey, all have this question about getting people to buy into this. And I think that you answered that 
really very well about seeing seeing yourself from the outside. So um, I'm going to move on to some, some other questions that we have, because there were a lot of questions about that. But one that was interesting was about transitional branding. Um, yes. And, and that is, uh, I think this was Julie um, wrote in that there's a commercial district that she manages. It's in transition, but really needs identity. They have a vision, but she feels it's a little too early to hang their hat on that vision. Um, how do we handle that? How do you handle that, that timeline? Yeah, that's a great question. Julie, you know, one of the things that you really have to be focused on is, first of all, um, when you are, are developing a brand for a community, it, it's not like you are deciding on what your tattoo is going to be designed. You, first of all, recognizing that you are a community in transition, a district in transition, that is a, a really great step to be at. Um, there are times where we go into a community and we'll develop a system and we say, you know what, chances are if you start to hit on some of these things that you have determined for yourself as being parts of your vision, then chances are in five years or so, you're going to need to go back and revisit this. You're going to have to figure out what you are and, and how you've evolved over that time. Now, one of the things that I, I do really very much focus in on, though, is I believe that any time you create a system, it has got to be built off of the mindset of it has to be aspirational. It has to give a community room to grow. If a, if a brand is only relevant today and can't accommodate change and growth, then it is too limiting on your own community. So it does have to be truthful. It can't be too overly ambitious. It can't sit there and say, hey, you need to come visit our community, and then when you get somebody to come visit, they're disappointed because there's nothing there yet. But being able to create something that resonates with the locals, helps to foster local pride, helps to foster economic development efforts and fuel that transition with the understanding that in five, ten years, you might look very, very different, and it might be time for you to go back and kind of reevaluate that. Another thing that I really focus in on and I'll, I'll kind of recommend to folks if they identify that they're transitional is maybe you can truly benefit from not worrying too much about the graphic aspect yet. Let's focus in on beginning to get some of our tools in place. Maybe we can start to bring some uniform typeface across organizational boards. Maybe we can start to land on some colors that can provide some consistency and give ourselves the time before we invest too much in an overarching system. So that's how I would tackle that. But that is that, that building a system that is based off aspiration is a big, big focus. Great, Ben. Thank you so much. And, and speaking of that, since you're talking about colors and different different aspects of branding, Mike from Connecticut um, said that he's discussing, and, and by the way, He's discussing taglines for economic development, and I laughed out loud when you gave us some of those examples. They're just fantastic. But so in in his town in Connecticut, they're creating a tagline for economic development marketing brochures for the town. Right. And he says, but this seems to be a subset of the larger topic of branding the community. Can you discuss how the two topics relate to each other? What comes first? How do you begin? Um, you know, is there one tagline for the entire for the town and a a different one for economic development, et cetera. Right. Okay, that's great. You know, here's the thing. Um, we have worked on projects in essentially every different variation of how that could all come together. We've worked with some communities where we have developed a brand community-wide, and we've created a tagline that is, it just makes sense. It's flexible enough and adaptable enough to be able to be used in different applications. I think back to one of my favorites, Stanton, Virginia. And in Stanton, Virginia, they're the home of the American Shakespeare Theater. They've got the world's only reproduction of uh, Shakespeare's indoor theater called the Blackfriars. And they're just a truly dynamic place. Well, the tagline that we used there 
was the simple phrase, as you like it, reference to a Shakespeare play, but also speaking to, to really a place that you can create your own experience no matter how you like it. The Economic Development Department created a very simple adaptation of that business as you like it. And it allowed them to easily tie into that. Now, that being said, economic development focus has its own target, has its own communication, has its own realm that it walks in. We have worked with other communities where all we have done is focused in on that economic development message. So I think the big thing that I would recommend uh, to the community there in Connecticut is this. If if you are at a process where you are thinking through economic development messages, it is absolutely appropriate for you to consider and ask the question, should we do a better job of thinking how our message to prospective business, current business, and economic growth factors in to our message to visitors that a convention and visitors bureau might be uh, cultivating? How does it connect with our message from our chamber, who should be supporting our local business community and, and focus on business retention? How does it focus on a downtown or Main Street organization that might be really connecting with locals and nurturing the heart of the community? It, it is an extremely appropriate time to have that conversation and see if you can rally people to get on the same page. That being said, you are not breaking any rules if what you end up doing is creating a message that is custom tailored to your economic development efforts. You are not failing if you create something that is really focused on having the economic development effort achieve the greatest level of success. But I think it's always good to see whether a conversation can start there. So. Sounds like a, a lot of partnership and talking to folks, which brings me to a couple of people also asking it from California um, uh, to Hawaii, actually, about regions. How can we what, – what about a collection of communities that really want to create a brand as a group or a region? Or from no, Noel in, in uh, Hawaii about covering 33 neighbors, but in, from one island. Yeah. Yeah, I saw I saw Noel's message from Hawaii. Um, I, I wanted to say that I think that that issue is far too complex, and Noel needs to bring me out to Hawaii for me to answer in person. But um, I I didn't figure that that would actually go over. Um, you know, I think one of the big things that we have to remember it, it's actually whether the issue is talking about communities, whether it's talking about a series of municipalities that might be collected inside a, a county, whether it's a collection of cities and counties collected inside a region, I think one of the biggest things that you always have to focus on is in creating an overarching system. The key to success is empowering those individual identities. And celebrating the individuality and the differences of those, whether if we're talking about 33 communities, there are ways that we can create threads that stitch those communities together, and at the same time, we can go through and, um, and create a way that we can spotlight the individuality of those. We did a project years ago in Concord, North Carolina, where we created an overarching identity for the community. Then we created 14 different community logos. And we used through an expanded color palette, an understanding of the typefaces that we're using, um, you know, we were able to create connectivity while also preserving that individuality. And it's that preservation of individuality that is truly important. Uh, two weeks ago, I was working out in Oklahoma, and I was doing a countywide brand. And the community had, I believe, six different municipalities in the county. So what we actually did was we created an infrastructure through color and typeface that connected but then we allowed those individual cities to really kind of get in and do their own process of deciding what their graphic should be. 
So they're part of a bigger system, but they also feel very, very connected to the, the imagery that they've selected. And I think in that same um, in that same conversation, I'll reference a question that just came in from Diane Laird there in uh, Delaware right up the road from me. She asked, colors are extremely important, and the color palette appeals to different genders. In your color selections, have you found that you ultimately choose a color palette that appeals to one gender as opposed to another? Now, that's a really interesting question, and to be honest with you, I think that that question um, actually moves away from just color palette into to designs that we select for the graphics as well. I think one of the things that we attempt to do is we attempt to create color palettes and graphic systems that never walk too far down a particular gender route. Uh, to be honest with you, I tend to stray away from using a lot of flowers, using a lot of, of kind of floral imagery and things like that, but I worked in White Sulphur Springs, uh, West Virginia, and one of the things that they were connected to was an image of a dandelion. And what we actually did was we created a stylized version of this dandelion that took something that typically might be very, very feminine, and we created something that existed in a more neutral space. But we also have started in our public input having the community itself begin to describe both itself and its neighbors as people. And it has been very interesting how we have seen a correlation between the self-identification of the gender of the community and the color palettes that we select. So if a community identifies themselves as being a sophisticated lady, then the color palette is going to be very different than if it describes itself as an ingenuitive, um, you know, ingenious young man. So I think that, that those things do all kind of connect to one another. Ben, one more before, and we're, we're nearly out of time. But it brings me to another theme that I'm seeing in the questions that, you know, how do you really include people of all economic groups? How do you include the old timers who think everything is just fine with new ideas? Um, in other words, if you're only reflecting the perspectives of movers and shakers, then you're limited. How do you really feel you're including everybody in this significant decision? That's great. You know, first of all, I think one of the things that we have to remember is uh, this community I was in last week, Williamston, South Carolina, we were creating an image there that was, uh, it was a little bit more contemporary. It was, um, it was a little bit more abstract. And one of the things that I knew is I knew that those old timers, I knew that uh, less affluent members of the community would have different ways that they interacted with those messages. You know, when you talk about old timers, many times because of the, the economy that we've had here in the United States, a lot of the old timers today have experienced our communities in their heyday. They've experienced their downtowns in what they consider to be the heyday, especially these rural communities that used to have vibrant economies because they were the only alternative. Now what we've seen is we've seen a constant hesitation. It's not really a fear of change. It's actually a fear of a second failure. They would rather keep things just the way they are today than get their hopes up about something that they see fail again. And in addition to that, the realization that downtowns of yesteryear will never be like they were. But the great thing about downtowns and communities of today is instead of being the place to go because it was the only option, it's the place to go because you choose. It's your best option. What we try to do is we try to span the gamut with the, the overall design approach. So, like I said, in Williamston, we created a very contemporary identity for the destination identity. We had a lot of people in the community that were very connected to their park and were connected to the gazebo on that park. 
we left that imagery for the town seal. We were able to mix the old and the new, the sophisticated with the less so, and create through event logos and brand extension the ability to really wrap everybody in. Thank and you. I see that it's five o'clock on mine, yes. so I wanted to cut mine short. <laughs> We we are we are out of time. I think people will allow us to go just one thirty seconds more. Just you know, what can people do next week to get their branding project off the ground? Mary Lou is from Wallkill, New York. She's excited about seeing all in Wallkill. Um, but just thirty seconds. What what can people do next week to get started on this? I think one of the best things you can do is simply go through and look at everything that currently exists now evaluate the diversity and just truly how many different messages your own community is, is conveying through the municipalities, the organizations, and things like that. And with that focus, I think you will see that your community is probably not making it anywhere near as easy as it should be for the consumer and the resident and the prospective business owner to really connect with that place. So being able to just evaluate where you stand today, there's no reason to move forward if you can't get your arms wrapped around where you are today. And that would be my suggestion for what they can do um, Thank first. Thank you so much. Ben Muldrow, you're remarkable. It was a terrific, engaging webinar. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, and thank you all for participating. Yeah, I can hear the virtual applause from coast to coast. This recording of uh, the webinar and responses to some of the questions that we missed will be emailed to you and also be made available at our website, www.communitymatters.org. Thanks to uh, CERD, the Citizens Institute on Rural Design, and the Orton Family Foundation folks who run the back room so well and make these sessions possible. Thank you all for participating. We hope you join us next time. The June call will focus on inclusive communities where all citizens have equal treatment and opportunity in decision-making processes that affect their lives. Watch for information in the next few weeks about future CM calls. Good luck with your branding. I'm Fran Stoddard. See you next time. Bye-bye.